At Staples Business Advantage, our team of experts can help you find the break room products to satisfy everyone's preferences, while AI can suggest popular items, monitor stock levels, optimize pricing, and automate reordering. AI can do a lot of things, but I can never know the taste of a truly great cup of coffee. Sigh. But you also can't get hangry. This is true. Let Staples Business Advantage use today's latest innovations plus our team's experience to make stocking your team's break room easier for you. Sign up today and save 20%. Staples Business Advantage. Business is human. Shares for beginners. If we were to take two banks and we took the names off the top so we wouldn't be able to identify from the numbers themselves who they were, if we could find two banks that were remarkably similar, one was issuing a hybrid with a yield of 3.5% and one was issuing a hybrid with a yield of 4.5%, it's pretty obvious which one we would go for. So that's really our approach. We're not necessarily taking very much a brand name view. We don't want to say that we hold all the best brands and here are all the logos. All we want to say is we want to get the best out of the hybrid asset class. G'day and welcome back to Shares for Beginners. I'm Phil Muscatello. If you've ever owned one of the big Aussie banks, you would have seen offers to purchase what are known as hybrids. So what are hybrids? Today, I'm joined by Brad Dunn to find out what these things called hybrids are. G'day, Brad. Good to see you, Phil. Yeah, great to have you back in the studio. Lovely to be here. Brad Dunn is the Senior Credit Analyst from E-Invest's Dehoff ETF. So tell us about hybrids. What are they and what do they mean? Sure. Hybrids are a very unique type of security and they're issued by companies and financial companies like banks. But generally speaking, banks are the biggest issuers of these particular types of securities. And at a very, very high level, they have elements of debt or bond securities and they have elements of equity securities. And they come together and uh, they form this particular type of security called a hybrid. And they're traded on the the market, aren't they? Generally speaking, they're traded in the market in Australia, Mm -hmm. but that's not always the case overseas. So we'll get into that, I suppose, a little bit later. But uh, in Australia, you will be very familiar with them trading on the exchange, just like any other share. So these are instruments for companies, and especially banks, to raise capital. Now, I thought it was just on debt markets, you know, like in the fixed income ETFs that you manage, or raising capital on the market itself. But this is another way that they can raise money. Is that the case? That's right. So hybrids have a very special purpose. So if you think back to about 2008, when we had what everybody knows as the GFC, at that time, banks weren't holding enough capital as they probably should to hold against the loans and the assets that they hold. So the regulators took a look at this and they said, OK, banks, you need to raise more of this type of capital that looks like a fixed income security for most of its life. But in the very rare circumstances where you need an injection of equity really quickly, what hybrids do is they can actually be converted to the equity or shares of the underlying issuer. So that is what their role is. So when you're thinking about investing in hybrids, think about as you providing a service to the banks, because those banks are holding that sort of capital and paying you a return while they're waiting on the very, very small chance that they would need your help to turn that into equity at some point in the future. Has that ever happened? It has, but they've been very clear that they were going to do it and they did it in an environment where you receive the shares of the issuer and you've got plenty of time to decide whether you want to keep them, whether you want to sell them on the market and receive your full value of the hybrid back for them. So yes, it has happened, but it's been very much in a controlled environment. It's been very, very rare, especially in Australia, but also offshore, that uh, they've needed to actually do this in a stress scenario where they've actually needed to draw on some of the features in the hybrid terminology. I believe that these days there is a question over whether banks and other companies can offer these directly to shareholders as they have been in the past. What's the situation developing now? Yeah. So if you're a shareholder of any of the major banks, I think you probably would have at some point in the past received letters at home asking you, would you like to participate in one of these new offerings? They would often have a fancy name like Pearls or something like that. So you were given the option to do that as a valued shareholder of the bank. But in the last couple of months, in fact, in October of 2021, there were some rules changed about how financial companies and asset managers like ourselves can interact with end investors. And to that end, there's a couple of acronyms. There's TMD and DDO. But what it means at the end of the day is that a bank or a fund manager like ourselves need to think very closely about who is the right market, who is the right investor 
to be offering our product or service to. And that is something that we've been thinking a lot about, but we think it also has implications for the banks because they need to think about, would an investor that perhaps doesn't have as much investing knowledge, are they able to process the details in a fairly detailed letter about a new hybrid security? So that's certainly going on in the background and it's still an open question as to whether the banks are going to be willing to offer those types of securities into the future given this change in the rules. And because they are traded on the share market, there is a possibility that they will lose value at particular points in time. Of course. And that's the same with any traded security. And to be honest, once it actually lists on the exchange, there's nothing stopping any investor from calling their broker or getting onto their share trading account and buying it anyway. So it is a bit of an open question because as much as you want to offer these securities to the right people and protect them and and make sure that they understand what they're getting into, once it's listed, then it's fair game and it's open season, basically. So it's still an interesting development. But yeah, we watch this space closely. What is the problem then with an individual investor going on the market and just buying them just to get the rate of return? Because they offer a, a slightly better rate of return than a term deposit, don't they? They do. Yeah, that's certainly the appeal and why most people will look at them. I think the fact that they're issued by really good quality names in the first place. I think, you know, but for a few people that have had some rough experience with the banks, most people overall have quite a positive view about the actual strength of the banking system here in Australia. You know, it's well run, it's well capitalised, and people generally trust that the institutions will be here one year, five year, 10 years into the future. So that's not necessarily the biggest issue. The biggest issue with hybrids is when you see a new offering, the document that comes with it is generally 150 pages or or more. And that's what can trip people up because while there is a fair degree of standardisation, there are things that can change. And if you don't have the time to sit down and read 150 pages, you may miss one of those little nuances and it could come back to haunt you in the future. Mm. So, of course, in all these situations, active managers can add value to a basket of hybrids and that's what you're offering, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. So that's what I spend a lot of my time doing. So I spend a lot of time in these documents. So I know where to look. I know where the changes happen because I'm familiar with a lot of them. You get to know them. So that's part of the value that we can add. But secondly, what we can bring is a much broader universe. And we start to look a lot more broadly because you know, in Australia, we've got great institutions. We just don't have that many of them. And to be honest, most of your listeners and probably most investors around the country, be it in their super fund or be it in their personal account, they will probably have a lot of bank equity holdings already anyway of the four majors and the regionals and so on. So there's that problem of concentration because Mm -hmm. everybody wants income in this environment, but to do it with the same limited amount of institutions as you already hold in your equity portfolio means that there is that concentration aspect that you need to consider as well. What is the kind of return that hybrids offer? So at the moment, one of the issues we're facing is that the bank bill swap rate or the short-term interest rate that is very sensitive to movements in, say, the RBA cash rate is still quite low. There's been a lot of talk recently about when the RBA is going to start moving. We don't think it's still for at least 12 to 18 months ourselves. We've still been fairly conservative in that respect. But with interest rates so low, all of the hybrids are priced off that interest rate. So you've got nothing to start with, and then you've got the margin on top that's and coming what, through. And what is that margin? So the margin at the moment is somewhere between 25 and 3.5% per that's, annum. That's not bad, though. It's not Considering bad. Considering you're getting less than 1% in a term deposit. That's true. We're always very careful to start comparing them to different you know, products like that and, and term deposits, especially because they are very different and they do carry investment risk. So we just wanted to sort of put that out there. But the other thing is, if you talk to 100 people, you'll generally get 90 different answers as, as to where they think they sit in the spectrum. So, you know, we obviously know that cash is safer than fixed income. Uh, fixed income is generally safer, quote unquote, than equities or property. And then within that spectrum, where do you sit hybrids? And as I said, there's a lot of conjecture about where the right place is to sit them. So when you compare it in that sense, there are some people that do like to compare them against cash and term deposit-like investments. And there are some that see the aspects of equity that can kick in in certain circumstances and place them further up the spectrum. And that just leads to a whole range of different conversations about whether they're good value, what the relative value is like, and where they actually fit in a particular portfolio. So what are your thoughts on inflation and interest rates? You know, there's some people that think we're going into a period of hyperinflation. Yeah. And um, other people think, well, no, it's it's not going to be the same as what it's like in the past. How do you feel about it and where interest rates are heading? 
That's a great question. And I think that anyone that can sit back and opine authoritatively on this subject is probably making things up. Mm. It's a really hard question to answer at this point in time. There are a lot of cross currents and there are a lot of moving parts. From our perspective, we think that inflation is not going to go into that hyperinflation type scenario, nor are we going to head into what's called a stagflationary environment. So stagflationary environments are probably the worst of all environments for investors because you've got that combination of very stagnant growth and high inflation. Now, while we say that is, we still think there is an element of transitory nature to the inflation aspect. But what we also don't want to forget is that there are some real factors as well, larger factors, that continue to track on their merry way that have been disinflationary in the past. So the two that I'll mention is the general indebtedness of the world, So, you know, countries and companies and individuals sometimes have taken on a lot more debt to get their way through the pandemic. And debt doesn't magically just disappear. It needs to be paid off. And that takes time. And the second one is demographics. So from what we understand, the uh, workforce in China, for example, actually peaked a couple of years ago. So there's actually sort of less new people coming into the workforce in China as there are older people leaving it. And that has implications for the world as well, in terms of being able to manage the amount of output that comes out of China and some of the other effects that happen there. So demographics is another big factor that can influence inflation and interest rates, rather than just what's happening about not being able to get your Christmas presents here by December 25th this year, which is, I think, going to be a problem for people in the short term. But we caution against having that cloud some of the larger movements that are still happening that we think will impact inflation and interest rates as well. Yeah, or the price of turkeys for Thanksgiving this year in America. Exactly, exactly. (laughs) Yeah, all of those things. Yeah. Let's talk about the argument for global and local hybrids and mixing them up in a portfolio. When we looked at putting the Daintree Hybrid Opportunities Fund together, we looked very closely, not just at the Australian scenario, but it's not just banks in Australia that need to raise this capital. It's actually banks around the world. The regulation that's driving this is actually global. So we looked at banks and we wanted to identify banks that were similar to the Australian banks in one or many ways that also offered these hybrid securities. Because we thought if we could put a portfolio together of those higher quality banks around the world, we could start to generate some true diversification rather than just saying we held 25% CBA, 15% NAB, that was our diversification argument. Mm. We could say, not only do we own the best Australian banks, we've also gone to Canada. We've found the best banks in Canada with a system that's very similar to Australia in a lot of ways, and we include them. We go to the United States, we find some great banks there, household names, and we do the work and we find some of them that issue hybrid securities to our liking as well. And we go to Europe and we do the same thing. So we've taken those steps. And what we found was the way that hybrids are treated and priced and traded offshore is often very different to Australia. The ownership base is different. So in Australia, it's generally mums and dads, self-managed super funds Mm -hmm. and smaller shareholders. So you've got a very, very broad, diverse ownership base that are very attracted to the franking credits, which come with Australian hybrids, but they're generally very much buy and hold. So they'll buy them, take the coupon, put them in the bottom drawer and generally not trade them. When we look offshore... What we find is that the trading environment is very different. There are different investors involved. There are institutional investors, and they have a very different outlook on hybrids. They will be very much about the return. So if the yield that they're being offered isn't what's up to scratch, they will sell and they'll move on to something else. If the yield being offered is really attractive, then they will buy as much as they can find in the market. So it's a very different type of scenario. And that gives us additional opportunities, not just to find great securities to add and mix with Australian securities, but also to find yield advantages. Because and that's uh, been presumably they're sometimes they're going to be trading lower and offering a better yield. Is that the case? Yeah. yeah. And it's been quite consistent, actually. Wow. It's really interesting to see that the yield uplift or the yield differential that you can achieve from a security that is similarly structured, so we've read the terms, from a similar issuer, And all of those things, we match it as much as possible, but we can get 70 basis points, 100 basis points, up to 140 basis points of additional return by adding these offshore banks. Hmm. So it's that kind that was, of like buying something at less than its net asset value, kind of. Yeah, kind of. But, yeah. but when you look at it... Or you net can, return value or whatever the technical term is that I don't know. Yeah, you, I, mean, I mean, you can position it in a whole number of ways. But the way we look at it is if we were to take two banks and we took the names off the top, so we wouldn't be able to identify from the numbers themselves who they were, 
if we could find two banks that were remarkably similar, one was issuing a hybrid with a yield of 3.5%, and one was issuing a hybrid with a yield of 4.5%, you know, it's pretty obvious which one we would go for. Mm. So that's really our approach. We're not necessarily taking very much a, a brand name view. We don't want to say that we hold all the best brands and here are all the logos. All we want to say is we want to get the best out of the hybrid asset class. And that means we have to look offshore and we need to take that into account, bring it all back to Australian dollars so we don't take any currency risk. Mm -hmm. And once we've done all that, if we can find better yields offshore, then we will own them. What's the criteria that you use to identify banks that are similar to ours? Sure. It's a number of ways that we use. First, we look for legal structures that are similar to Australia. So Canada, for example, I mentioned that earlier, that is a Commonwealth country. So, you know, Commonwealth-style legal system. Mm. So that's all very uh, similar to us, very familiar to us. Its housing market is very strong, so there's a lot of demand for residential housing. The Canadians love their houses just as much as we do. And also, the banks themselves, it's what's called an oligopoly-style structure. So there are three or four large banks that hold a predominant amount of market share, but there is that vibrant secondary level as well, where there are some smaller banks and some non-banks and whoever sort of compete in the market as well. So market structure are very similar too. And we think that's good because having those four pillars, if you will, in Canada provides that stability to the system. Do they have a four pillars like we do? They don't have a four pillars policy, Mm -hmm. but it turns out that they've got four banks that are much larger than the rest. So it's a de facto four pillars in that sense. What are some of the names of the banks that um, are in the portfolio? Yeah. So at the moment, we've got JP Morgan Chase, Bank of America in the United States. We have Royal Bank of Canada, and the Toronto Dominion Bank in Canada. We have a bank called ING Group out of the Netherlands. We've got a really interesting bank called Swedbank out of Sweden. The interesting part about Sweden is their regulator, so their version of, of APRA, their bank regulator, is so particular about the amount and level type of capital that they hold, the amount of hybrids they can issue, the types of hybrids they can issue. They are so particular and so overbearing on the banks that they hold so much capital they don't know what to do with it. <laughs> and for us, that's really appealing because they could live through a, a nuclear winter a volcanic eruption, an earthquake, a zombie apocalypse, apocalypse, anything, yeah. And they would still probably survive. So that's how much capital they've got. So, you know, (laughs) that, that for us is, you know, a very appealing thing for us as a hybrid investor. So, you know, those sorts of things come into our thinking when we look at names. At Staples Business Advantage, nothing can top the smarts and instincts of the thousands of experts on our team. While AI excels at processing data, automating tasks, and providing insights for better decision-making. And when they're used together, they're they are far, far more powerful, powerful than, than either, either is alone. alone. Whoa. Whoa. I've never felt more alive. Let Staples Business Advantage use today's latest innovations, plus our team's experience, to make business easier for you. Sign up today and save 20%. Staples Business Advantage. Business is human. As the portfolio manager, how do you manage risk in constructing the portfolio? A number of ways. First of all, we use all of our standard measures. So proper diversification, a good fundamental process to weed out the good from the bad, the wheat from the chaff. And that's been pretty successful to get us down to a good manageable group of names that we can then add to the portfolio. On top of that, we use something called our overlay. So I'll explain what an overlay is in a minute, but the overlay is there to not only add an additional little return stream, but also to manage risk. And I'll explain what that means in a little bit more detail. And then the third thing we do is we have what's called a tail hedge or a tail cushion. What it does is it's there for when markets decide in their infinite wisdom out of the blue to drop by 15 or 20% in the space of a week. Because what we know is that hybrids will often go with that market drop. And that can be quite affronting to an investor that's owned a hybrid for a couple of years, has gotten relatively comfortable, their coupons have landed on time and everything's great. And then all of a sudden we see the value of them drop by 5 or 10%. It has happened in the past and I'm reasonably certain that it will happen again in future. It's just part of the course. But within our fund, we have the tools to actually put a little protection mechanism there. So that if that event did occur, we'd be able to dull some of that volatility in our returns. Because ideally, we want to reduce the drawdown because the most difficult part of recovering from that drawdown is getting back to level. You know, a 10% fall requires way more than 10% upside to get you back to 
to Just level pegging. Yeah. So we want to avoid that as much as possible. So there are the three ways we do it. But just to maybe go back to the overlay and give it a little bit more context. So we know that hybrids often perform like fixed income securities, but when markets get tough, they start to begin to act like equities. But it's often at the times you least want them to. So what the overlay says is that hybrids have a particular type of structure. What we can do is we can put some trades in that go counter to what we think will happen in that downside environment to protect us against some of that volatility. Now, it sounds complicated, and we've got, you know, two people at Daintree that do that specifically. They spend a lot of time thinking about what's the best way to do that, what's the cheapest way to do that, what's the most impactful way to do that. And at the end of the day, we want to, as I said, try to remove some of the volatility that comes from securities and make them look and feel as much like a fixed income security as possible to give you that extra level of comfort. Is that like hedging? Is that what's called it hedging is, yeah. in a way? It, it is hedging, mm. but our overlay program tries to do that and more. To generate it more of an income as well? That's right, yeah. yeah. We want to be able to offer regular and stable coupons. We want to be very clear and be able to do that. And of course, our hybrid book will always generate that coupon for us. But if we can add a little bit of additional income onto that, then in this type of yield environment, I think that's going to sort of um, be a lot more valuable than the sort of the 100 basis points or so that we're actually talking about will generate because that 100 basis points, that's 1% or so. That's largely what you can get for a a long-term cash deposit at the moment. So hybrids plus that little protection mechanism coming together to really sort of provide that service or to extract the full potential out of hybrids is, is the way we like to put it. What's a coupon? Oh, it's just a distribution payment. In bond world, in fixed income world, we call them coupons. It's also another name for distribution or a income payment. So how does DHOF compare to other hybrid alternatives? Well, it's a mixture of some of the best aspects of hybrids. So compared to alternatives, they generally either look fully international or fully Australian. And DHOF has that mix between local and global. To the best of our knowledge, our peers in the space also don't have that protection or overlay mechanism in place. So they tend to, you know, build a portfolio of assets and then generate the coupon, or the income payments, and then generally don't have any other things around that. So you get to ride the wave of the ups and the downs. So adding that element to us, I think, differentiates us as well. Mm. And the point to note is Daintree Capital has partnered with eInvest for many years and Dehoff is our third fund. And in our other two funds, we have this same overlay program running and it's got several years of track record behind us now. So we've tested it in real world environments. We've tested it in 2017, 2018, for example, which was an interesting time in credit markets. And it seemed to have you know, come out of that quite well. And we've learned a lot from that. And of course, 2020 got another good test of the program. Mm. So it's had some real world experience. So we're confident that including it in DHOF, will give us that result that we need and differentiate us from the market as well. So even though hybrids are traded on the market and have the same market risk, they can go down when the rest of the market goes down, presumably if you hold on to them till the end, that you get your original capital back. Is that the way they work? Yes, and that's been overwhelmingly the case for many years. But there's definitely a few terms and a few dates that you need to look out for and be familiar with. Yep, this is in the 150 pages. That's right, that's right. I'll try and summarise about 50 pages for you in in, in a few minutes. But the first date to note is what's called the call date. So the call date is the first date that the issuer can say, okay, we've decided that these securities have played their part and it's time for us to redeem them, to buy them back from you. In which case, at a call date, they can say, we're going to pay you the par value, the face value of the security, plus the final distribution, the final payment. So you'll come out square and received all your income payments along the way. So the call date is very important. But the call date isn't mandatory. The call date is only optional. The issuer can still say, well, we like these securities. We like having you as a hybrid holder. We'll decide to not call these, in which case they will trade on generally for another one to two years. Okay, so you need to be aware that that call date is not an end date. But generally after that, after another two years has passed, we have what's called a mandatory call date. Hmm. So the mandatory call date will happen. You will get your money back and you will get your final coupon, subject to a couple of criteria being met. Generally speaking, it's that the, uh, the bank's share price is above a certain level 
which is a, a generally an easy threshold to make, but it's just something there to, to be aware of and needs to be met, and that the regulator says it's okay for them to do it. And it's generally because they'd be replacing it with something else or they've raised a different piece of capital somewhere else. So the bank would be in no worse position by redeeming it. So that would generally happen at the mandatory call date. And then you've got what's called the actual legal date, which is perpetual. So there are some situations, very, very rare, where they can actually trade without a call date and they lose the call dates and they start to become what's called a perpetual security. And if any of your listeners have ever heard of a code called NABHA, they would know what I'm talking about because that was one of those rare securities back in the olden days, back in the late 90s, where it actually lost its call dates and it became what's called a a perpetual security. Is it still on the market? No, it eventually got bought back, but investors only needed to wait 20 years. (laughs) So it was a long wait and there was a lot of ups and downs along the way. We had the GFC, we had other market ups and downs, we had the pandemic, but it was eventually bought back by that bank. So it's just one of those things that you need to be aware of, as I said. So if you're aware of those key dates, you've got a broad idea of of what you could be in for. However, if you don't want to worry about all of that sort of stuff, you can go to an ETF to have this all managed for you. Yeah, absolutely. We think it's one of the ways that actually um, we can help our investors as well, because you know the paperwork involved can get tiresome and you probably got paperwork coming out of your ears already anyway. So I hope the discussion today hasn't necessarily scared too many people away from hybrids, given that they can be a little bit technical. But yeah, the reality is with the click of a mouse and the trade of a single security via DHOV on the ASX, you can get access to that asset class, have someone like me working through the detail, creating a portfolio, accessing securities that you can't from your share trading account or your stockbroker, and then having all of that protection underneath it as well. So if we do see those market uh, volatility events, you will be able to watch and, and hopefully write it out from the sidelines you know, without anywhere near the level of volatility that others would be seeing by simply buying a Pearls 10 or an NAB hybrid mm. and then just going along for the ride. So that's definitely an appeal for the, uh, the one trade ETF structure. Without getting into the nuts and bolts of portfolio construction, because we can't actually construct anyone's portfolio here on the podcast, what part can this ETF take in someone's portfolio? Sure. So I'll just put it out there that this is general advice, of course. Yes. But from our perspective, we think it should sit in the income bucket, potentially also in the alternatives bucket. They do have some features that would easily be able to classify them into the alternatives bucket if you take that view. But generally speaking, they should be looked at as income generating securities. But you need to understand that those income generating securities come with a little bit of market exposure, not the same amount as equities, but more than cash and more than a very high quality fixed income or credit portfolio. That's where they should sit. But they come with franking credits and they're issued by great names. So putting that all together, I think you can be very confident to include them in the income part of your portfolio. And how can listeners find out more about DHOF? Where's the web address that they can go to? Sure. They just need to get online, einvest.com.au forward slash hybrids for beginners. And we'll have lots of content there, lots of information to get you started and hopefully convince you to join our growing crew. And if listeners sign up before the 31st of December, we have a special offer. So if you buy units before the end of the year, we are offering a fee-free for the first six months of 2022. So invest before 31 December, hold your holding through to the end of June, and then you will receive bonus units in July as a welcome to the fund. All the details are in the PDS. Be sure to read that before taking any further action. Brad Dunn, thanks very much for joining me today. Thanks, Phil. If you found this podcast helpful, please tell a friend, especially if it's someone who needs to start thinking about investing for their future. You'll be helping them and helping me to keep this show on the road. Shares for Beginners is for information and educational purposes only. It isn't financial advice and you shouldn't buy or sell any investments based on what you've heard here. Any opinion or commentary is the view of the speaker only, not shares for beginners. This podcast doesn't replace professional advice regarding your personal financial needs, circumstances or current situation. And thank you for listening to my podcast. Up. 
At Staples Business Advantage, our experts can help you find furniture that fits any design and budget, while AI can recommend products based on preferences, generate 3D models for visualization, and optimize space planning for office furniture. Take advantage of our team's eye for style and design. And my eye for, wait, I have no eyes. Only algorithms. Let Staples Business Advantage use today's latest innovations plus our team's experience to make furnishing an office space easier for you. Sign up today and save 20%. Staples Business Advantage. Business is human.